open our Bibles to the book of Philemon. And just to re review a little bit, uh, there's three main characters in this little letter. It's written by the Apostle Paul to a man named Philemon who lived in a city called Colossae. And the church in that city apparently met in his home, according to verse 2 here of Philemon. And he had a slave named Onesimus. Onesimus ran away, uh, somehow made his way to uh, Rome, where Paul was imprisoned, connected up with Paul somehow, and uh, Paul led him to Christ. And now he's sending Onesimus back to Philemon, along with this letter and the letter to the Colossians. And so we talked about that last week, how you need to look at both books together to get the full, the full picture here. And we, we're seeing that it's a book that talks about uh, spiritual refreshment. Um, you see the word used a couple of times there. You see it in verse 7. We're going to see it again today in verse 20. It's about spiritual refreshment. And, and the topics that are talked about are fellowship, uh, because at the beginning Paul commends Philemon for his loving fellowship towards other believers and how uh, that has been, brought refreshment to many. That's our, our verse that's up here on the screen. And, and we've seen that uh, refreshment comes through forgiveness. And last week we started talking about forgiveness. We talked about loving forgiveness, uh, forgiving in a loving way. Today we're going to talk about obedient forgiveness. So let me read verses 17 to 21. And uh, that's where we'll focus our attention here this morning. It's verse 17, Paul says to Philemon, So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. So here he's giving more instruction to Philemon regarding the returning of Onesimus. And you'll notice in verse 20, he says, Philemon, refresh my heart. And forgiveness is refreshment to a heart and soul of, of a person. And those who have been forgiven by God uh, must be forgiving of others, must be forgiving of others. And if real forgiveness brings refreshment, to withhold forgiveness when you should forgive, uh, well, you, we could say it's cruel. It's cruel not to forgive when you should forgive. Uh, look with me, let's keep your finger there in Philemon and turn back to 2 Corinthians just for a minute. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And in this letter, in this chapter, Paul's talking about somebody who apparently had been uh, removed from the church at Corinth because of some, some unrepentant sin. And, but now they have repented and they're coming back. And Paul is giving them instructions on what to do with this repentant sinner who is now coming back into the church. And he says in verse 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6, for such a one, this is the person that was uh, in sin, this punishment by the majority is enough. Okay, you did what you were supposed to do in, in dealing with them, but now that, that's done because they have repented, which should be the goal to begin with. So, verse 7, you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Uh, the, the man, if he's repentant, he is sorrowful for what he has done. And if he comes back in repentance and asks for forgiveness, for that forgiveness not to be given would be to make his sorrow excessive. So it's piling on at that point. You've done what you should have done in dealing with the person, but now they have repented, now they have come back. You need to love and forgive. And to not do that is being unkind. 
to, to the person. So it works both ways. Refresh, uh, forgiveness brings refreshment. To not forgive brings excessive sorrow. I, I don't think we want to do that. Uh, let's, let's look at another passage because Jesus talks about this in Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. Uh, he tells, uh, he's just talked about for forgiveness and how to deal with sin in the church in verses 18 through 20. So then Peter, Peter asks a question in verse 21, Matthew 18, 21. Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him as many as seven times? Peter's like, Aren't, wouldn't I be super spiritual if I did that seven, seven times? Uh, Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. And the idea there is uh, this forgiveness needs to be unlimited. And then he tells this story. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, I mean, he wouldn't have been able to pay in the rest of his life that amount, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of the servant released him and forgave him the debt. But, verse 28, when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, which is like lunch money compared to the amount he owed to the master. And seizing him, he began to choke him, began to choke him, <laughs> saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. The same thing the first servant said. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me, and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers, until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Sounds like this is pretty serious. Uh, the, this, and here's the person who's been, been the recipient of forgiveness of, a, uh, of an astronomical debt, and he goes out and starts choking his buddy who owes him a little amount. Um, to not forgive others is not to appreciate the forgiveness you've received from the Lord, and it could even be a sign that you're never, you were never truly forgiven. In, in fact, uh, you know, the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, 12 says, forgive us, Father, forgive us as we have forgiven our debtors. For some people, saying that prayer is like signing your death warrant. You want him to forgive you the way you forgive others? Is that what you really want? I, I think I'm trying to make a point here. Forgiveness is a big deal. All right, It's a big deal to God. It's not only a big deal on a personal level of the refreshment that you receive from forgiveness, but this is, this is important. Uh, to God. So let's, let's look at point number one there on your handout. Forgiveness is required. It is an act of obedience to give forgiveness. In, in verse 8 of Philemon, it, it says, Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required. There's the word required. Hey, Philemon, there's something that you're required to do here. And then in verse 21, he says, I am confident of your obedience. Yeah, this would be the obedient uh, thing to do. This is not an optional thing. Hey, 
Philemon, it's not like this would be a good idea if you would consider doing this. No, this is required. This is obedience uh, to do this. And we, we've seen that it's clearly commanded. Forgiveness is clearly commanded. We looked at Colossians chapter 3 uh, last week. And in Colossians 3.13, the second half of the verse, it says that we're to be forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. You must forgive. And you need to remember, we read other verses around that. Verse 12 of Colossians 3 says, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved uh, this is who you are. This is what God has done for you. Uh, you. You are to put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. And verse 14 adds, and above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And, and so forgiveness just goes along with all of that, being kind and compassionate and, and, and loving one another. And it does talk about things that you need to put off if you're going to be able to do that. Back in, in verse 8 of Colossians 3, it says, put all of these things away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. So you've got to put all of that aside, which was characteristic of your old life, the life of the flesh, and you're to put on who you are now in Christ and be compassionate and kind and humble and patient and, and loving and forgiving. It's commanded. We must, it says we must forgive. And, you know, in a parallel passage, if you want to look at this in Ephesians chapter 4, it says uh, basically the same thing. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. So that's the command. And again, there's some things you need to put aside if you're going to really be able to do that. And those are in verse 31 there. It says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. It requires some work to do this. You've got to be dealing with these sinful attitudes, bitterness, anger, and you need to put on kindness, compassion, and be forgiving towards one another. It's clearly commanded. And if you go back to Philemon, you'll notice that Paul says, yes, it is required. But I want you to see how Paul talks to Philemon about this. And, um, and how he appeals to him uh, to do it. Uh, like we saw in verse 8, he says, I could command you, but I'm, I'm, I'm appealing to you. I'm, I want to encourage you. Uh, he, he's, he's showing love towards Philemon and even how he instructs him to do what is right. And in verse 17, he called him a partner. That doesn't mean they went through the partner's book together. Uh, <laughs> but he calls him a partner, and the word there for partner is koinonas. Uh, you've heard of koinonia, fellowship. Koinonas is a partner. And that's the idea. We, we share a, a common spiritual life. We're partners in this Christian life. And so he's, he's saying, if you consider me a partner, receive Onesimus just like you would receive me if I was to show up. That, that's, that's, a, that's something to think about. I mean, Philemon would be pretty excited if Paul showed up. Is he going to be excited that, that Onesimus is showing up? The idea there is that we are all equal partners in Christ. So it's not like I'm going to be more forgiving towards some people and not so much towards others. Now we're, all, we're all equal partners in this. And we need to remember that uh, as we think about forgiving one, one another. And, and look at um, the end of verse 19 
and we've talked about this before, where Paul reminds uh, Philemon to say nothing of your owing me, even your own self, which uh, I- indicates that Paul was the instrument God used to bring Philemon to the Lord as well. And, and, and th- there's that reminder that we need to have. If God has forgiven us all of our great and numerous sins, that should motivate us to forgive others for their relatively small and few sins against us. See, we we tend to not think very highly of the forgiveness we have received. Uh, We think very highly of of the sins people commit against me. You you got to recognize we all have a built-in bias towards ourselves. And I'm not so bad. I, maybe I can even understand why God would forgive me. You know, even me. But uh, this person that has sinned against me, they don't they don't realize how serious that is. I, I think that when we remember the forgiveness that we have received, and and you saw that in both of those commands in Colossians and Ephesians, we're to forgive others just as we have been forgiven. I think that that helps us to be obedient and forgive. And that obedient forgiveness brings refreshment. It brings refreshment. And I, I uh, wanted, uh, want you to look at verse 21 because you see there that Paul really thinks the best about Philemon. He says, I'm confident of your obedience. Uh, I write to you knowing that you'll do even more than I say. Uh, He's confident that Philemon's demonstration of obedience is going to be like over the top. Uh, You know, it would be one thing for him to receive Onesimus back and put Onesimus uh, back to work. That's another thing to to kill the fatted calf and have a party. Everybody, Onesimus is back. The one who was lost has been found. Let's rejoice in the Lord. So uh, forgiveness is, is an act of obedience. And even if you don't feel like forgiving, obedience is always the right thing to do. Obedient forgiveness refreshes, refreshes, but not if you do it in kind of a cold, grinding, mechanical, technical kind of a way. A loving, kind forgiveness brings refreshment. Okay? Is, is that clear that we're commanded, it's required, we're, it's obedience to forgive? We all, we all got that? All right. So that raises a, probably a ton of questions. And you're probably thinking in your mind right now, well, what about, what about this? Or what about that? Or what if this? Let's turn your page over, and uh, we'll try to answer some some questions. Because number two says forgiveness is conditional. Uh, that that's a big question because people will say, uh, "Well, what are you telling us? Are we supposed to just give a blanket forgiveness to everybody for everything? Is that is that what we're doing?" Well, does God give blanket forgiveness to everybody for everything? Are there conditions? Yeah, you've got to repent and believe for the forgiveness of your sins. Is that right? So he's not just forgiving everybody who's ever lived, and they're all going to heaven. That forgiveness is conditional. In Luke 24, 47, when Jesus was talking to the disciples, he says, you've got to go and preach uh, this message about me, and you've got to preach repentance for the forgiveness of sins. That, that, that People need to know, you repent, you'll be forgiven. And, and in Acts 10, 43, uh, Peter is, is saying that forgiveness comes to all those who believe. So repentance and believing, and that's, that's a part, uh, we, we could call that 
judicial forgiveness. When we come to the Lord in repentance and faith, all, all of our sins are removed, right? We stand perfectly justified before God. In fact, uh, you might have heard this word recently, Christ's righteousness is imputed to our account. So, you know, you fire up your computer in the morning, you go to check your balance in your account, perfect righteousness. That, that's, that's, what, that's what you have. It's judicial forgiveness. Do, do Christians still sin? Yeah. And in 1 John 1, 9, it says, if we, for, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. And that's written to Christians. And in fact, that's a statement that describes a Christian. And so we recognize there's a judicial kind of a, a, of a forgiveness that we receive at salvation. But we, now we have a relationship with the Heavenly Father. And that relationship requires that we confess our sins and receive that forgiveness. And as our Heavenly Father, He disciplines us too, doesn't He? Yeah. So it, the, there's a relationship there, and it re, does require confession of sin for the, for the forgiveness. And that's the kind of forgiveness we're talking about between one another, that relational forgiveness. We're, if you're a Christian, we're all in the family. Uh, but we have relationships with one another, and forgiveness... Uh, is, is given to those who would come and confess their sins and ask for forgiveness from you if they've sinned against you. Are we tracking with this so far? All right, because I'm trying to help answer questions. So, so, so it is with us. And, and you see that here in Philemon. Apparently, he confessed what he did because in verse 11, Paul says, he was a useless slave to you. And so apparently, how, how, did, how did Paul know that? Well, I think Onesimus told him what he did. So he's, he's come clean about what he did. And, and his repentance is seen in the fact that he's going back to Philemon. He, he's not only turned around in his heart, you know, and turned from his sin and turned to the Lord. He's literally turning around and going back. Uh, I think that's a sure sign of, of his repentance. And, you know, sometimes repentance, depending on what is done, requires restitution. And, and apparently uh, Onesimus, when he left, he didn't just leave by himself. He took something from Philemon, probably took money, and that's how he got to Rome. And, and so Paul is saying there in verse 18, if he has wronged you at all, and the way that is stated in the original, it's like, yeah, he, we, I know he did. Since he did. Since he has wronged you, and since he owes you, charge that to my account. So Paul is recognizing, hey, some restitution has to take place here. I'll pay for it. So what he's doing is he's removing any objections, removing any obstacles from Philemon fully forgiving Onesimus. Onesimus has done, everything's been done that, uh, from Onesimus' side that needs to be done. He's, he's confessed his sin, he's repenting and returning, and, and whatever he owed has been, been covered. So Paul is, is uh, removing any objections, any obstacles, uh, so that Philemon can fully forgive Onesimus. And, and that kind of Conditional forgiveness is what the Bible teaches in our relationships with one another. Let me just remind you of a couple things. Go with me to Matthew 18 again. And we'll look at some of those earlier verses where Jesus was teaching about forgiveness. Verse 15, Matthew 18, 15. says, if your brother sins against you, just forgive him and forget about it. Is that what, is that what your Bible says? I just want to make sure you're actually looking at the Bible. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault 
between you and him alone. If he listens to you, which you know, it would imply he, he, he agrees with you, he confesses, yes, I did that, and he asks for forgiveness, then you have gained your brother. The, the restoration has taken place. Okay? But it didn't just happen. You had to go and show him what he had done, and he, and he listened to you. Okay? And it goes on to say, but if he does not listen to you, Take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. So now you bring some other people because you're really totally committed to the restoring of this relationship. And, and you don't want to see your brother in, in this sin, in this condition of this unconfessed sin. And you really want to restore the relationship. So you bring some others with you to help with that. And... and and hopefully you win him, that this helps, that there's a restoration. But it says if he refuses to listen to them, in verse 17, then tell it to the church. Why? Because we want, now we want the whole church involved in helping to restore this situation. Tell it to the church. And then if he refuses to listen to the church, even now there's people in the church reaching out to him and encouraging him to, hey, let's make this right, Let, let's do what we need to do. But if he refuses to listen to him, then you treat him as a Gentile and a tax collector. You treat him like an outsider. But, you know, this is a pretty intense process trying to bring about restoration here. This is Operation Restoration. And everybody involved in this process has to be ready to forgive. Hey, I'm going and I'm talking to my brother and I want to forgive. I, I, I'm not here piling on. I'm not here to beat up. I'm here to forgive and to restore. And, and if they would just confess their sins, it'll happen. But there's some things that have to happen. It's not just a blanket, oh well, he sinned against me. Okay, no big deal. We'll move on. Did I see a tentative hand going up over here? Yes. 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 Exactly. Good question. We'll come back to that. You're jumping ahead. Don't ever do that again. No. <laughs> yes, sir. Great, great question. Great question. Stay tuned. <laughs> okay. I'm trying to, I tried to anticipate these frequently asked questions and uh, to get to them. So, so Matthew 18 gives us one thing. Look over at uh, Luke chapter 17. Just to, as a quick answer to, to Scott's question there, that's why you, you would bring in a couple of other people to help clear that up. And, and we've said this before, if you're going to go talk to somebody in person, are, are you really, if they don't listen, if they don't agree, if it doesn't get worked out, are you really going to go get two other people and come back and do this again? Because if you're not going to do that, don't even go the first time. Because you're really not serious about it. So if you're going to start the process, you've got to be committed to the process because you love your brother and you want the, that restoration to take place. Luke chapter 17, verse 3, says, Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents... Forgive him. So does that sound like it's conditional? The forgiveness is conditional? Yeah, it, it, it is. It obviously is. If he repents, forgive him. But here's where it gets 
really challenging. Verse 4, and if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you, you feel free to doubt his sincerity. Is that what it says? You must forgive him. You must forgive him. So how's your forgiveness meter going? Are you, uh, where are you on this forgiveness scale here? How are you doing at forgiving people, you know? Yeah. See, what, ha what happens here, and I'm just going to speak honestly from observation and experience, uh, when my brother sins against me, he's like the last person I go and talk to. Uh, I'm talking to people, but not him. That is sinning. That's gossip. That's slander. That's malicious. That's cruel. That's unkind, unloving. But that's what happens so often. I'm not going to go talk to them and try to restore the situation. I'm going to go tell other people what this person did to me. Let me just tell you what this person did. And I'm trying to win favor to my side. Like I'm trying to win. There's a conflict between me and this other person. I'm trying to get people on my side of this thing. Just remember, when somebody comes to you and starts telling you about somebody else's sin, if you receive that information, just count on it. They'll be talking about you someday. And you need to tell them, you need to not listen to that. We could shut this whole thing down if people would not listen when somebody comes to gossip about what this other person has done to me. If you would just shut it down and say, hey, you have an issue with this person, you need to go talk to them. And, or you could even say, I can't believe what you're telling me. I know that person. I can't believe what you're telling me. If you've got a problem with them, you should go work it out. I'm sure you could. You start doing that enough times, people will stop bugging you. And, and you'll feel refreshed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so uh, that was just for free. That was just like a little aside. I don't know. I, I, I got kind of worked up there for a minute. Um, please forgive me. All of this here these verses that we just looked at in Matthew 18 and Luke 17, they indicate a strong willingness to forgive and restore. See, that's why you've got to look at those commands to forgive and the verses around them that talk about being kind and compassionate and loving. That's, that's how it's got to be. You've got to be, all, I'm always ready to forgive. Uh, some translations of Psalm 86.5, that's what it says about God. He is ready to forgive. Are we thankful for that? Some translations say he's forgiving by nature. Are we thankful for that? Yeah, we are. And that's the way we need to approach this. I am, I am ready to forgive. I want to forgive. I want there to be restoration. I don't want there to be this thing between us. And and here's another thing. Uh, if you're going to go to your brother and show him his sin, it better be sin. It, it better be sin. You be, better be able to point to a chapter and verse. Is it really a sin? Because there, there are lots of things people could do that I don't like. I could have even been offended by it could have uh, um, you know, been something I disagreed with. But was it sin? Maybe not. See, if I'm going to talk to somebody about their sin, it better be a sin. Not just something I didn't like or something you did that bugged me. And again, that, that's why you know, reading all these other verses like bearing with one another being patient with one another. That's where those verses come in. Hey, they did something that bugged me, but 
I, you know, I, I can bear with them. And, and let me just show you a couple of verses in, in Proverbs. Proverbs 17, 9. says whoever covers an offense seeks love in other words i've been offended but I, i'm going to i'm going to cover this up I, i'm not going to make a big deal about it i'm not going to go talk to other people about it, it, it uh, i'm going to be patient kind compassionate uh lo loving but the rest of the verse says he who repeats the matter separates close friends yeah that happens they did something I didn't like. They did something I didn't agree with. Let me tell you about it. And, and I, don't want, I don't want you to be their friend anymore either. You see that? That's the idea here. I'm trying to win people to my side here. Uh, that, that's, not, that's not right. And in chapter 19, verse 11 of Proverbs, it says, Good sense makes one slow to anger. So if you're quick to anger, what are you? Stupid. <laughs> well, wouldn't that be the opposite of good sense? Stupid. Good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. Overlook an offense. So that's, that's you know, you, you're drawing a line. It could have been something that was offensive to you, but it wasn't a sin. I can overlook offenses. I can be kind and patient and gracious in those cases. So if I'm going to talk to somebody about their sin, it, it better be a sin. All right? Is that helpful? Yeah. You know, I've 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 uh, heard teaching on, you know, where you should uh, address a sin. It's not loving to let a person sin, and you don't, and it, that's not okay. And and I've heard people say, well, if you're doing that, then like in my marriage, I just would be confronting my spouse all day long. Come on. Your spouse can do a lot of things that you don't like, but are they sinning against you? Come on. Well, let's, let's think about this seriously. I mean, you live that closely with somebody, they're going to they're gonna do a lot of things you don't like or you don't agree with. Amen? Amen. Thank you for being honest at church here. Uh, yeah. But are they, are they sinning? No, come on. Uh, it, it, it's we we are way too sensitive to the things people do that we don't like. Um. So, uh, true true forgiveness is refreshing, and so is our fellowship. And you know, all of this comes under the loving one another, bearing with one another, being kind to one another. All, all of that, that kind of fellowship is refreshing. Where I'm not letting everything everybody does bug me. Okay? Did I, did I make that clear enough? Um all right, well, let me, let, let's go then to the uh, conclusion, and I've got more things we can talk about regarding this forgiveness thing, okay? Because I've heard other questions other than the ones we've already talked about. Maybe here's a new one right here. Yes, sir. Yeah, I mean, this is a hard thing. 
I mean, we're happy to have God forgive us, but we're, we have a hard time with forgiving others. Um, so here, here's another question. What about if the person who sinned against me is an unbeliever? Dun, 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 dun. This is the question <laughs> that we've been thinking about because, yeah, I got all these unbelieving family members. I'm going to have to see them at Thanksgiving or Christmas. And they've done something against me and it's you know there's it, it it's it's painful to be around them they're, they're an unbeliever well obviously it's not the same as a brother i mean what we're talking about with philemon and onesimus those are two christians and, and matthew 18 luke 17 talked about if your brother sins so what, what about what if a unbeliever sins against me uh, what, what are we supposed to do? Well, obviously it's different because the relationship is different. But let me just show you a couple things for you to think about. Look at Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 43. Where Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So God, there's a world full of unbelievers, right? Right? They have not received forgiveness from God. They have not come to him in repentance and faith. Uh, is, is God raining down fire and brimstone on their houses? No, he's giving them rain and sunshine just like everybody else. He's being good towards them. He's being gracious towards them. I, I think that's uh, something for us to learn from and because we're told to be like him. So how about being patient with these unbelievers? How about being kind towards them? How about being respectful towards them? And, and not seeking vengeance uh, against them. Uh, and, and never returning evil for evil. But doing them good. Does that, that help with your uh, unbelieving co-workers, relatives, whoever have sinned against you? Yeah, what you want to see is them to receive forgiveness from God by you being mean back to them. Well, that, that's not helping. Yes, ma'am. It depends. She's asking, should we talk to them about the sin that they've committed against us? Yeah, you can talk to them about it. And, you know, you might get an apology from them. Okay. Yeah, you can, you can talk to them. And, and, and I'm not saying hang out with all these people who are, who are being mean to you. I'm not, but some cases it's unavoidable. I mean, you work with them or they're in your family or whatever. And, and so, but see, this is an opportunity for us to show kindness and grace towards them. Yes, sir. You get to the point where there's no admissions, no acknowledgement, no agreement. Talk about my sir to that person. I should, I should, yeah, no, I should, I, no, you, forgiveness, I wouldn't use that word. I can love them. That would be the word to say. I'm going to keep loving them. That, that's what I'm going to do. 
for there to be a full restoration and a full forgiveness, there has to be an acknowledgement of that sin. But uh, I, that doesn't mean, I mean, Jesus says, love your enemies. You know, what, what, what does that mean? Love your enemies. You do good to them. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, that, that, that would be a good prayer to pray for your unbelieving friends. Say, God, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They're just living out their sin, and you're asking God to, to save them. And, and that should be what we would want, too. Uh, that, that's far more important than them making things right with me. In, in Romans chapter 12, it says in verse 17, repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Verse 19, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. You know, nobody's getting away with anything in this world. Nobody is getting away with anything. And God is saying, I'll, I'll judge them, you love them. But I think a lot of times we want to flip that around. God, how about you love them and I'll judge them? Just in this one case, God. How about how about we how about we how about we reverse it there? Yeah. Was was God loving you when you were his enemy? Was he loving you when you were hostile towards him? Yeah, he was. And we're supposed to be like him. Now, you know, I understand that there's difficult situations, difficult relationships. It's not easy. Um, but our, we're called to love people. And, and that's, that's, we, we need to be concerned with us fulfilling what the Lord wants us to do more than we're concerned about them doing what they should be doing. That just makes the conflict worse when we start thinking like that. And, and you know, there are, yes, yes, ma'am. Yeah, so I do good to them. I give them Thanksgiving turkey dinner. I, you know, whatever I can do to show kindness towards them, goodness towards them, I, they don't have to, I don't have to have forgiveness for them in order to be loving towards them. That was the whole thing. God, God gives rain to the just and the unjust, right? So I can show love to them and be, be kind to them um, e even if there's no admission on their part of their sin. Now, let me, let me say this, because the question about the arsonist came up last week, right? And that's, uh, you can forgive the arsonist, but you're not going to send them back into the forest with a blowtorch, um, right? So forgiveness doesn't mean be stupid. Loving people doesn't mean be stupid. And there are uh, cons there could be consequences. Uh, somebody could sin against you, and they have broken a law. Okay, and, and they could confess what they did, and you could forgive them, but they're still going to jail for what they did. All right. So it doesn't mean that there's no consequences uh, or, or there's no follow-up like that. But uh, our attitude is to be loving, kind, and forgiving towards them. Yes, yes. So that just answers my, my question I've been mulling about since we're talking in Matthew chapter 18 where the Lord likens the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who forgave somebody. And he gave that servant... Yep. But when the, when the servant demanded 
restitution of his own, a debt from somebody, then God, or it says uh, in verse, uh, then his Lord was wroth with him, wroth with him and then yeah. took him to the tormentors. Yeah. And then Jesus says, such likewise shall my heavenly Father do unto you. Yeah. So there's still consequences. Yep. Because I was struggling not to get a false inference from that text, because the, the servant was forgiven, but then later on, it looked as if that was... Uh, he, yeah, and, and you know that that's an interesting thing to think through. Um, you, you know, you could see that as the first person truly was a Christian. I mean, that's kind of the point. The story is being told here. the The master is is the Lord, and, and we're the we're the people, right? Uh, the first person. You, you could ask the question to this person where they, I mean, they may have been happy to accept forgiveness from the master, but they weren't willing to give it to anybody else. The consequences, w w could that indicate that they were not really a, a believer to begin with? Because th does God get angry with his people and throw them into prison and make them pay? You know, that would be a question. Or if you want, because, you know, you don't want to bend a story too far. If, if this is talking about somebody who's a true Christian, uh, who's unforgiving, are they living in the jail of bitterness? Uh, because I think there's a lot of Christians hanging out in bitterness land. Yeah, well, back here, hold on. Right, right back. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that's what Jesus said. You pray for those who pers you want what's good for them. Yes, yes, ma'am, right here. Right. Yeah, you to treat them like a Gentile or a tax collector in that context means treat them like an outsider, because that's how they're living. Okay, but the, but but that yeah, and so they're not seen as a part of the church. But that doesn't mean we don't care about them. And and in Second Corinthians two, you see the person who was put out come back, and Paul saying, "Hey, this should you should be happy about this. Love them, restore them, because that's the attitude you have in your heart from the very beginning." You see, when I go point out a sin to a brother, it's not to pile on, not to beat him up, not to tell him what a lousy person he is. Uh, that, that's, that's not the right way to, to go about it. But let's talk about, um, I mean, there are real hurts that we experience in this life, right? Yeah. In fact, I, I, I told my little group that I think one of the hard things about forgiveness is, you know, you got some real pain that maybe you felt from whatever they did to you. And dealing with that pain can be really hard um, uh, because I, I, I'm, in, in my heart of hearts, let's be honest, I'd like them to feel a little pain too, it, you know? And, and so I might withhold forgiveness until I feel like they felt a, a sufficient amount of pain, which is me making things even worse uh, than that. Mary, Mary Lou, did you have a question? Yeah. So, so somebody sins against your child. Yeah. I, well, obviously you're going to care about that. And you just need to apply all the things that we just talked about. You need to be loving with them, kind towards them. Doesn't mean that it, you act like it, it didn't happen or you're going to let them keep hurting your child. It, it doesn't mean that. But it does talk about your attitude towards them. 
and your goal is to try to win them. We're trying to win people here. That's, that's what we're trying to do. But let me, let me just uh, close by talking a little bit about the bitterness, resentment, or even the feeling that we could get that I was a victim. That, that's pretty big these days, isn't it? That's one of the, that's one of the big words in our, in our culture, uh, be a victim. Um, so you need to remember, if you forgive somebody, that is like making a promise that I am not going to hold this against you. We saw that in Isaiah 43, 25, where God says, I remember their sins no more. I forgive and I remember them no more, which means it's not like he forgets that it happened. It means that he's not going to hold it against you ever again. That's good news, right? God's not going to remember my sins against me. They're, they're forgotten. But for a Christian, I'm not going to go to heaven and there's not going to be a giant movie screen showing all the sins of my life. God's going to say, I don't remember those. I don't hold those against you. We're, we're done with that. Um, so I need to always be ready to forgive. I need to be loving. I need to be patient. And I think that if we have trouble with holding on to something that's been done to us, uh, one reason might be because we're too focused on ourselves. I mean, just to be honest, uh, it's not that you weren't hurt. I'm not denying hurt. I mean, we do, we, we do experience real pain in relationships. I'm not saying that you weren't hurt, but to hold on to that hurt is to think too much of myself. Like, how dare you do that to me? And I think it is, to hold on to it, is to not think highly enough of Christ. What I have in Christ isn't enough to help me overcome this. Is that what we want to say? And certainly Christ knows what it's like to be unfairly treated. Doesn't he? And in fact, he provides the example for us in 1 Peter 2, Verse 18, let me just read this to you. And this has to do with, this would go to Philemon and Onesimus, the servant and the master. 1 Peter 2.18 says, Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. Which is kind of a tame translation. The word could be translated the perverse. For this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Well, those are some, those are some powerful words right there. Uh, we would do well to meditate on those. And, and you know, I, I would encourage you to consider the life of Joseph uh, in Genesis 38 to 50. He was a victim. I mean, his brothers wanted to kill him, but then they thought, ah, oh, no, we can make some money off this guy. Let's sell him. And, and then he's mistreated by Potiphar's wife. Uh, and, and then he does good to some guys in the jail with him and the the one guy who benefits forgets all about him um, and then he has to do good to those brothers who wanted to see him dead and he says yeah and they were afraid once they realized who they were dealing with and and probably rightfully so they were afraid but he said hey i know you guys meant it for evil yeah yeah they sure did but god meant it for good and, and when you think about Joseph maintaining that kind of a heart and that kind of an attitude, he, he didn't have a Bible. He didn't have a church. He, he didn't have a Bible class. He didn't have a podcast. 
Uh, he, he, all he had was God. And that was enough. That was enough. Is God enough for us to endure the pains that we experience from people in this, in this life? I, I, you know, forgiveness refreshes the person that's forgiven. But, you, but when you forgive, you get refreshed too. It's a good thing. You're never more like God than when you forgive somebody else. And we're out of time. Hopefully we addressed enough of your questions and gave you enough to help you think through whatever questions we, we weren't able to get to. This is a big deal. It's a big deal to God. And it needs to be a big deal to us. And, and the thing that we need to keep foremost in our minds and hearts is God has forgiven me of all of my sins forever. I must forgive others. I must. If that's true, I must forgive others. Let me pray for us. Lord, we do thank you for your word and we thank you for uh, the power of it. Lord, as we just th thought through uh, the example given to us by Christ in 1 Peter and how we're called to follow that example and to be like our Lord, or even as we think about Joseph and, and his attitude through all that he endured, it, I think, Lord, it helps us to realize how much more we could grow in our spiritual lives. If those are examples for us to look at, we've got a ways to go. And Lord, I pray that as we continue to think about the greatness of your love and mercy and forgiveness towards us, that that would have a greater, bigger, wider effect in how we live our lives and how we relate to other people. Lord, that we might follow that example of our Savior and be a true representative of Him in this, in this fallen world. So Lord, I, I pray that you will drive these truths deep into our hearts and that we would find true spiritual refreshment. Not only in the forgiveness that we have from you, but in the forgiveness and the fellowship that we share with one another. So, so Lord, I, I pray for us as people, I pray for us as a church, that we would be a, a fellowship that, that represents true love uh, and patience with one another, kindness towards one another, and real forgiveness towards each other. So, Lord, we thank you for this time and your goodness to us, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.